This is a Security Weekly production. This week, Trend Micro announces a worry-free plugin. Checksmarks partners with an open source software management solution. Cloudflare lets you manage your CA. Okta introduces multi-factor authentication using fingerprints. And John will rant about threat intelligence. All that and more, so stay tuned. Welcome, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly, Episode 2. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined on the lines via Skype by Mr. John Strand. Welcome, John. Hey, made it in just a nick of time. John's in an undisclosed location. Happy you could join us today, John. Thank you very much for having me. This is very exciting. This is Episode 2. I'm, I, I, I got tingles. I got tingles. And, 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 and it's not just doing episode one twice. Right. right? It's, it's actually in episode two. This is, this is so exciting. Uncharted waters. <laughs> so exciting. We're going to talk about Trend Micro's worry free services. Everyone wants a worry free service. So it turns out they've integrated. Security's integra- easy. Yeah, security's easy. It's <laughs> worry free. Uh, Kaseya VSA, which is an award winning IT systems management and remote monitoring platform. Uh, I've seen this before where endpoint protection, antivirus uh, solutions partner with the IT management. I think in general, it's great. I am very concerned about this worry-free service marketing thing they have going on. Yeah, th- that worries me. <laughs> it does, it's very, it's, it's, it's worrying. God, that's a horrible pun. <laughs> it's just awful. It is. You can deploy worry-free services to every device instantly across an entire customer base. Well, there's, but there's a couple of things about this. Uh, Kaseya, you know, talking about uh, managed security service providing and just kind of managed uh, services and IT management solutions. I think people need to watch this very, very closely. And if I was going to be investing a large amount of money into solutions, I'd be investing in solutions like this. I'm not endorsing Kaseya or anything like that. I'm basically just saying this is where we're going. Uh, as as enterprises become more and more diffuse and people continue to work remotely, you're going to need to develop better solutions to manage that workforce. And these solutions can actually integrate very well. I hate to use the word cloud too much, but having that type of uh, kind of device and management platform for systems is, is huge, right? I mean, even if every single one of them we've ever tested has been a complete train wreck, I don't, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, Paul, but... Honestly, this is something that's going to happen. You're not going to have a centralized IT infrastructure. You're not going to have like your Active Directory behind your firewall, and there's an inside and there's an outside. It's basically you're going to have to be protect- protecting everywhere, and that's pretty much where everything is going to be headed, whether we like it or not. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, John, and, and I think you and I have talked about this. Like The IT operations folks, they have some really super cool tools to manage the environment. And then security gets like some really super cool tools and processes and they operate independently and that's bad. So partnerships like this, I think are good because the people on both sides of operations and security realize that like if they work together, that they can accomplish so much more by integrating these processes. And and this is just an example of that. I think, uh, you know, if you're a customer of either one of these particular vendors that this is something to pay attention to, but I think in general, it's good to have security and operations working together and good to have these partnerships uh, and uh, integrations. And uh, when I was stuck on the uh, runway in Dallas-Fort Worth, my, my airplane was going across one of the bridges and another airplane took a wrong turn. And we spent an hour nose to nose sitting there. I was going through and I was reading through these stories, kind of prepping for the show today. And uh, there's, a, there's an interesting trend that's at play at, that we talk about on the show, where you have Kaseya and you have that managed platform for managing devices remotely, kind of a managed security service provider or a managed services provider. And then the other story that we're going to talk about a little bit later is the Citrix uh, solution, where we have integration of security tools into Citrix. And these are two wildly different platforms, right? One is you can manage your IT infrastructure out in the field, and the other one is you're protecting that infrastructure in a Citrix farm and having people come into it. And, you know, I I think that that's going to be a cool theme of the show is which one of those two themes or which one of those two solutions do we like best? Which one actually wins out here in like five, six years? I, I don't know. But they, I think it's an interesting approach uh, for trying to handle security, 
people accessing data remotely. Yeah, I think it's interesting that uh, Citrix has a product called NetScaler ADC, Application Delivery Controller. And it seems to me like it's a load balancer kind of on steroids. Is that is that right, John? Yep, that's basically how you... Well, that's. It's one of the things that it does, but it's a close enough analogy. Yes. <laughs> and they've partnered with WebRoot to collect threat intelligence, which we'll talk about in the next uh, segment, that basically integrates the two. So as all of your traffic coming in and out of your, basically, your, they call it application delivery, right? It's essentially glorified mm -hmm. load balancing. Um, they're cross-referencing that with IP addresses that could be malicious. Now, say what you will. I think you're right, John. It's a good example of some traditional IT operations technology merging with security. And, and but I think it's I think it's a good I think it's a good use of threat intelligence. Mm. Uh, at least threat intelligence feeds and, and I want to explain why. If this was a merger or this was not even a merger, if this is a partnership between let's say Citrix and Symantec or Citrix and, and McAfee, that would be kind of interesting. But if you look at WebRoot, we don't see WebRoot very often at all in the enterprise space. Uh, I know that there'll be some people associated with WebRoot probably red in the face, screaming at their uh, screaming at their uh, their iPod or their iPhone at this point. <laughs> right. It's true. We just don't see it. But with WebRoot, you have a lot of home users. And if we start looking at enterprises that are becoming diffuse and the users are accessing enterprise resources uh, from their home computer systems, then a WebRoot solution will probably have better Intel feeds for that remote access Citrix solution than, let's say, a, a standard one that's standard for looking at threat intelligence feeds for enterprise attacks. And I think that that's one of the things that's missing is a lot of people don't understand threat intelligence for the home user is fundamentally different than threat intelligence for the enterprise. Mm, I agree. <clears throat> Another interesting partnership, um, checks, check marks. I keep on calling it checks marks. It's check marks, which I'm told is a global leader in application security testing and white source the continuous open source component management solution announced a partnership. Now, I thought white source's technology was interesting. Uh, and interesting when I think about when I got my start in IT, if you mentioned open source, like people threw things at you and like ushered you out of the meeting and said, you're not allowed to come to our meeting anymore. And we've seen a complete shift in that, right? Where most organizations in some capacity are utilizing some type of open source software. And this sounds like a company that is helping you uh, manage that. And now they've partnered with a security firm um, <clears throat> to help test those applications on the fly. And this is great, right? I know where my open source software is, and I'm applying some security testing to my open source software. Because as we know, open source doesn't equal security, and that code needs to undergo some type of scrutiny. So I thought this was another interesting kind of uh, uh, integration. I was just thinking about the the time that a guy threw a coffee mug at me uh, <laughs> back in 2001. I literally had a guy get mad and throw a coffee mug at me. He was that because you suggested a, they use Linux or? Yeah, that was, it was back in 2001, 2002 time frame. And uh, he threw this coffee mug at me and shattered. He didn't hit me because he works in IT. And, and you don't end up in IT by being, by know, being good at throw. sports. Yeah, yeah much, yes. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. <laughs> but <laughs> but so so this is this is interesting, though, because this is. I'd like to know who's behind financing a company like White Source. I didn't have a lot of time to look into mm. White Source. But if you look at it, there's got to be some big players behind this, right? A lot of companies that stake their claim on being open source providers of, of enterprise level solutions and integrating those solutions. People like Red Hat would be would be a really, really good example. But you know, I, I think that you made a really good point. We're gonna have people freak out. Open source doesn't necessarily mean secure. I mean, if you go to a, like, you know, Wikipedia level deep analysis, you're going to have people say, well, more eyes on the problem means that there's, there's better solutions. And I think that we now know that that's crap. <laughs> I mean, open source for like very large projects, if mm -hmm. you're looking at Linux, where there's lots and lots of people involved in that, yeah, I, I can definitely see how that would create some very good code. I'm not going to say it's better code. But then, Paul, how does something like this apply whenever you're dealing with open SSL libraries? OpenSSL libraries are used absolutely everywhere. It's an open source product. Clearly, the people behind OpenSSL are heavily overworked. Uh, some massive vulnerabilities have came out in that area. And I think that, that the timing of this is perfect because you have that news story, you have that hype cycle, this lands. I think they're going to get a lot of sales out of that just simply because of the news story with OpenSSL over the past couple of weeks. Yeah, and it's interesting. I was talking to uh, Farrow, uh, the CEO of NetSparker, about WordPress and 
as you know, John, we're pretty heavily invested in, in WordPress. And he, you know, he mentioned some interesting things. It's a very flexible platform, which allows for a lot of features. However, it doesn't benefit from a lot of security controls. And largely because it's such an open platform, anyone can write a plugin. And oh, by the way, when that plugin executes, it has access to everything. There's no yep. concept of plugins running in like a sandbox and only like applying an act. So the equivalent, the example he gave was a mobile application. You download a mobile application to your Android phone and it says, hey, this application wants access to your contacts, to your camera, your location, and you have to accept that. When you install a WordPress plugin, it doesn't ask you those things. Well, it, and this was a decision. <laughs> I remember mm -hmm. whenever we switched over to WordPress, and we've had some issues in the security front in WordPress over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, actually, that we, we we had that WordPress thing uh, right before we hired Joth, actually. Yes. Um, so, so, you know, but but I, I think that you and I both made a conscious decision that if WordPress gets compromised on the BHIS website, if it get com gets compromised in Security Weekly website, that it's embarrassing. But I think that we both made a very firm <laughs> we have a very firm understanding. Don't put anything sensitive there. If it's yeah. a website, it's a brochure site, you're hosting some stuff, make sure that you have regular backups. You get pop, you revert. It's embarrassing. Do a Mia Copa on Twitter and just move mm. on. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it is interesting as we think about enterprise security and the solutions you should choose. And I always tell people, think about where your data is. And right now, our websites, we're not storing user passwords. We're not storing user registration, user data in any shape or form on our websites. So it well, carries the appropriate are... level of security controls. Now, when we get to that point where we are doing that, our security is going to have to increase two to three, four, five times when we start doing that. And there's going to have to be a lot more controls and security process in place uh, to handle that. So, um, <laughs> yeah. And, and when we're talking about WordPress, if you're an enterprise listener, you probably shouldn't be using WordPress for anything sensitive. It's basically what we're saying. Yes. Um, but but do you think that this is actually going to move the needle? Um, so we've had some experiment with checkmark, or as you like to call it, checksmarks, yeah. uh, which honestly, as soon as you said that, I can't get it out of my head. <laughs> that's just what I'm going to call them from now I think, on. I think of checks and, mix. I think that's why. Checks mix. <laughs> actually, I haven't eaten today. I'm very hungry. <laughs> but I, I, I so l let me back up for a couple seconds. We've used checkmarks. Um, we've used their product for source code analysis reviews. They do have a very good... They're a very cost competitive solution. Mm -hmm. There are other products out there. I think you have to talk about Veracode being in this space. Yeah, certainly HP HP's Fortify is one of the market leaders in, in static analysis. Absolutely. And I, I would say personally, I put Checkmark at, at the bottom of the list as far as functionality, its ability to detect things. But whenever you're pulling cost into the mix, uh, it's probably one of the better values. Yeah. A lot of the other, other solutions are far more expensive out there. But uh, but no, I, I think that this is it does a good job. Now, how do you think this is going to play out with solutions like Swamp, um, like you know the software assurance marketplace? <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, I, a, I, I recommend that enterprises use the Swamp. Um, yeah, because it's free and it's really good. <laughs> and we interviewed yeah. the people that created it, and I, I I believe in it. I think it's a great uh, system to use, and it's interesting that. We talk about the security of open source software. Now we're using largely open source software, although there's some commercial players in in the swamp, so to speak. And uh, you're using that to secure your commercial or internal applications. And obviously there are security concerns to that, but I think that the benefits far outweigh the risks in terms of uh, using an open source uh, collection of tools to analyze your software for vulnerabilities. I think it's a a valid option because there's such a low cost and low barrier to entry to do that. Yeah. I, I think it's funny, kind of a funny story about the swamp folks. Um, I guess I can't remember who it is on the show that always refers to this as like inside baseball. Um, it's like, you guys are always playing inside baseball, but so the swamp folks, we've had them on the show. Uh, we've talked about their product. I've added them into uh, SANS 504 hacker techniques, exploits and instant handling. And swamp is in talks right now to come out with a desktop or a local version of swamp. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that are very nervous about loading up their source code up to the cloud and mm -hmm. running any type of analysis on it. And I think Swamp was popped last year, or at least they were down for a short period of time. And it was funny because I'm like, oh, I'd love to have an option to run the the, the local version. Mm -hmm. And they responded back. And they're like, well, we don't like to do anything for people that have done nothing to help us. And I was like, oh, that that hurts That's, a little bit, like maybe yeah. maybe a lot. 
but but in, in spite of whoever said that being a complete rampant ass, it, it's a great product. It it's free, and it also produces very good reports. And the ability to run a whole bunch of open source uh, software security tools, and then even some of the commercial tools, if you get the proper authorization, is a fantastic solution. Um, and then if they can come up with a local instance of it, I think that it becomes something that goes head to head with something like this that that actually costs. Yeah. And that becomes one of the problems. Whenever you're dealing with many of these products, not mm. all, they insist on you sending your 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 source code to the cloud. And then having that processing done offline. I know HP is notorious for that. And I don't know how comfortable enterprises actually feel. Um, even if it is open source software that they're uploading, once again, I don't know how well that's going to go over with many enterprises. Mm. The other story I thought was interesting this week was uh, Cloudflare announced uh, their Origin CA, which looks to me like you can manage all of your cloud instances across multiple cloud providers, I think that's largely what Cloudflare, Cloudflare uh, aims to do. This lets you manage your certificates across all of those to be able to issue certificates, revoke certificates across all of your cloud instances. John, I'm curious to see what you think about this, this new, new feature from Cloudflare. So I, I met Ethan yesterday at the Homeland Security Conference, and uh, Ethan was all over me because we want to actually get this set up for the BHIS website. And basically what they've done is they've, they've turned, and I think it's even mentioned in the article, the cost of actually getting SSL to zero. Um, you just, and, and they have like a free solution. You can set this stuff up and you can work through it. And then you can have all of your SSL traffic going through. Um, so, you know, we kind of have a mixed history with Cloudflare uh, at the Security Weekly family. Um, you know, we had a member years ago that actually publicly called them out on their DDoS production suites. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Allison did a great job in that presentation. But I'm consi consistently seeing Cloudflare do amazing things. And what this is basically doing, if we're talking about this from like enterprise and financial planning and forecasting, this is basically getting their fingers into more and more and more companies. Um, they're just solidi solidifying themselves as being the market leader for what they're doing, be it DDoS production, be it for CA, whatever it is that they want to work on, they're solidifying because They've just expanded their access to multiple different customers. And if you're somebody that's watching the enterprise security game and you want to see a company that does something right, uh, let's use Rapid7 as an example. Rapid7 has the Metasploit project. They support the Metasploit project. They love care and feed the Metasploit project. And oh, by the way, they have all these other products. Almost overnight, Rapid7 popped up and was a huge competitor to Tenable and Nessus. And then let's look at Tenable and Nessus. Nessus has the uh, home feed. And you can run it on your own local, local things, and that gets people hooked. So this is an outstanding kind of play-by-play -play on how good security companies play. Give something that's value-free away, that establishes you, gets you in the front, you know, hearts and minds of all of your customers, and then you have an amazing pool in your Rolodex that you can do for additional sales. And you're going to be one of the first people that they come to whenever they want to start purchasing like DDoS protection. So I think that this is once again, this is just a great play. Compare this with like a company like FireEye, which seems to be in retreat, and what they're actually doing in the open community. And you get an idea of what good, successful security companies are going to be doing over the next five years. Absolutely. Uh, last on our list for the news, Okta, who offers multi-factor authentication, now does so for iPhones with your fingerprint. So I, I got a question for you on this one. Um, I, I think that this is a, this is a smart play. But we have Google Authenticator, and Google yeah. Authenticator integrates with my uh, fingerprint on my uh, Nexus phone and has for a long time. And we've integrated at BHIS for free. How does a company like Okta, who's clearly coming to this late in the game, compete with a company like Google that, once again, is doing things right, doing things for theory? How do they actually compete, I, I think, is a question that everyone has to ask. Yeah, so my uh, kind of summary of Okta is that it can do the multi-factor authentication for a lot of different applications. So you basically uh, multi-factor authenticate to Okta, and then you can access all of the resources at your organization, and they kind of do all that through like plugins. So they kind of manage that process for you. That's my estimation of Okta, having used their software uh, in addition to speaking with them at a recent conference. Yeah. And I, but, but still, you know, I still kind of put it on the table. If you're looking at uh, companies like Ping Identity, 
if you're looking at once again Google, we we can actually we have plugins and there's code for integrating with websites. There's code for integrating via SAML. There's code for integrating over Active Directory. I mean, it's basically all out there and it's very easy. So it, the only thing that I can see them actually bring to the table is saying that we're easier than the competition, and that is that is a <laughs> that is a pond that is very very quickly getting drained um, in this space. It's you know if we go back six years. And you say that you're easy, like if you're going head to head against like a Tivoli suite for federated identity and access management, things like that, easy wins. And that's basically where companies like Ping came out and just slaughtered and yeah. did a fantastic job. But well, now, see, Octa's mobility integrate, management is is pretty good too. So you can load custom applications. Yeah. You can have uh, like your organization store along with the public store as well uh, on mobile yeah. devices. I just really wish that they would have been a little bit faster uh, to the scene. Um, they're Johnny come lately in this and they might do it better and that's great, but it, it's not a wow factor. It's not, I don't, I don't see it actually moving like stock price or sales that much uh, mm. because that, that, that type of two factor authentication has been around for a while and a lot of people just expect it now. And, and a lot of people don't like using the fingerprint. A lot of iPhone users I find don't like the fingerprint readers. And now is, why is that? I, I'm I don't not sure. I, I, I didn't I, use the fingerprint reader on my iPhone. Um, when I switched back to an Android phone, I use the fingerprint reader all the time now. So is yours on the back of your phone? Because mine's no. on the back and it mine's on the is front, where my hand goes. And I've only configured oh. one fingerprint right now, which is kind of annoying. I got to figure out if I can do multiple, depending on which hand you're mm -hmm. holding it with kind of thing. Um, it yep. doesn't work when your fingers are wet, <coughs> which I wouldn't expect, yeah. it, to, <coughs> expect it to. Yeah. Um, but I, it, overall, <coughs> I think it works pretty good. Cool. But yeah, I, the only reason why I like using my fingerprint reader is because it is on the back and it's just naturally where my finger goes whenever I pick up my phone. Mm. Um, so my phone automatically unlocks. So I the think nice, a lot of that technology has to do with where it's positioned. The nice part is your kids don't get into your phone <laughs> yet. So, Until my son yeah. figures out how to clone my fingerprint, which I think he's actively working on as we speak. But uh, if you enter your fi the fingerprint wrong, it gives you the, the pattern. And my pattern mm -hmm. doesn't like show you where you're going on the pattern. So if people mm -hmm. are shoulder surfing, it's really hard for them to get my pattern. Yeah. So fun fact, uh, a lot of fingerprint reading software that's out there today and devices. Uh, Brian, uh, my brother, Brian Strand, who's also with the Offensive Countermeasures team, uh, he can actually log into a number of my devices with his fingerprint. Oh, that's right. I remember him saying that. <laughs> so. <laughs> doesn't help you so with your brother. No, no, no. It doesn't help me with my brother at all. I, got, I now have an evil twin brother who's 10 years younger than I am. So, well, That's pretty flattering for you. <laughs> it is, absolutely. So, John, let's talk about one of your favorite topics, threat intelligence. Now, what's interesting is you've already spoken in a positive light about threat intelligence. However, there are a lot of caveats that come along uh, with threat intelligence that we've talked about a lot uh, over, over time. So why don't you get and give your, your spiel on threat intelligence? I so, so just from an alt, from a high level perspective, like a philosophical perspective, you can't buy intelligence. Um, you just can't. And it's it, so there's some things that are very frustrating, right? It's people think if they purchase a product and a threat intelligence feed that somehow they now are more in the know. They now have that inside baseball about what attacks and attackers are doing, and that's horrible. And I, I you know, I, I talked to a number of threat intelligence vendors, which is really disturbing to me because I ripped on threat intelligence feeds mercilessly for like yes. six months. And when I run into them, they're like, thank you. And I'm like, why? I basically said your product was a flaming bag of poo. And they're like, no, 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 it's good because it's basically forcing our customers to come to re the realization that if a threat intelligence feed is not something that you just simply plug in and it works like magic in your environment. Yeah, and, and so John, that's what a lot of feeding. people think. Uh, just to hop on the point for one second. They think I get a threat intelligence feed and magically, it tells me which devices are compromised in my network. Sweet. Yeah. And that's not how and, it works. It, it's not how it works. Um, and it's the same thing with hunt teaming, you know, and we're, we're in the hunt teaming space. Mm. And one of the big things that we have to fight are companies that are like, well, this company over here has an automated hunt team platform. Well, that's stupid. Um, it doesn't work that, like that. You can't automate a hunt. You can't well, automate I, threat I think it goes back to a lot of um, detection type companies, right? I mean, that's their goal. Like FireEye, for example, right? They're like, we'll tell you what you know, what what malware you know came into your environment, kind of, and they all do it to a certain percentage. But ultimately, you have to tie multiple solutions together, have a process, uh, have a plan, have some talented people, 
looking at all the data and come up with your own method for determining what's compromised in your environment. And I think people gravitate towards defensive solutions that have the promise of, well, they can just tell me what's owned in my environment. And that, and people have that about threat intelligence. It's amazing how much time and effort people will put into sifting through threat intelligence feeds to figure out what's compromised in their environment rather than looking at their own logs or network traffic to figure that out. <laughs> so, and I think that's true, but there's also a bigger problem that I'm seeing right now. Uh, like just today, I got a call from one of our customers in, um, in Minnesota and they're getting, they're getting, it appears that they're being targeted by the Dradix, uh, uh, kind of encryption malware and they're actually having it make it through and they run FireEye. They've got a bunch of threat intelligence feeds. They got a fairly good configuration on their iron port. Uh, they, they've got a lot of things that they're doing and they're doing right. Okay. The problem is that the malware is making it through. And the actual signature base doesn't hit for another hour afterwards. Mm -hmm. So one of our one of the things that we talked about is let's talk about quarantining all email messages that come in for two hours. Um, so if something's coming in from the outside and it has an attachment, quarantine that 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 that, att that attachment in that email for two hours, and then basically have a scan and check it, make sure the the threat intelligence feeds and the signature bases are updated before it goes through. So the problem with threat intelligence is a lot of that threat intelligence is old. It is. Even if it's an hour old, it's it's old. And that, that becomes a problem, and those bad guys can actually make it through. So we're having companies now come to us, and they're like, well, we've been doing everything right. we got these threat intelligence feeds. What can we do? You know, we spend all this money. It's great for catching the old stuff, but the stuff that's really bleeding edge, and it's all bleeding edge malware, becomes more and more problematic. And... One of the things I always tell people is if you're hunting and you're merging threat intelligence feeds, do a hunt based on a threat intelligence feed that is current, but the data, like the NetFlow analysis, the DNS analysis is a month old. Uh, because a lot of those systems that were hiding at the bleeding edge, who they're talking to, the domains that they're talking to, the IP address ranges, the ASNs that they're talking to, um, a lot of those are going to be more well known. So that creates another fundamental problem with threat intelligence feeds. But once again, a lot of the threat intelligence feeds vendors they're updating DNS, they're updating your routers, and they're creating dynamic blacklists, and they're doing things that, that honestly, Paul, we were doing, once again, you know, this, this makes us sound old, we were doing 10 years ago, pulling things down from DShield, pulling things down from, uh, uh, from a number of different blacklists online, and then dynamically updating our routers for blacklists on the edge of our network. That's mm -hmm. kind of what we were doing. And I think a lot of the threat intelligence feed vendors will say, that's fine and that's good, but you have to do more. You have to see what the threats are actually doing. How do they move laterally? What are their tactics, uh, techniques, and procedures, their TTPs? And make sure that you're developing architectures that can stop those. If you're not, you're not really using your threat intelligence feed properly. Yeah, it's interesting. <clears throat> when I talk historically, uh, to kind of go back in time, uh, I was part of uh, an ISAC group, right? And there's lots of these different groups that exist. And there was one for education. And they would share, hey, we're seeing this kind of attack, right? And it was interesting because universities sometimes would see these attacks before other organizations or corporations would see them because they would test it out in the university environment. And if you can get the kind of intelligence that we got for the most part, I think it was really good because you're like, oh yeah, that attack has that particular pattern. I can go now look for that on my network and see if I've been compromised. But I think it's gotten so watered down now from that that you're not mm -hmm. able to do that. That it, it they're, you're just the, the level of intelligence that you get from threat intelligence um, it doesn't have that benefit where I can get something specific about a threat and go find it in my environment. <clears throat> now, if you can do that, I, I think that's really good. But I feel like it's, again, watered down. Yeah, it, it, especially whenever you start talking about IOC feeds, mm -hmm. where you basically have a blacklist that never worked, and we're creating more detailed blacklists, which are further not going to work. Um, it, it, it's kind of like we're missing the point uh, on how we're actually implementing it. It's like there may be some great technologies out there, and I can kind of see through some of the rust and 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 all of the all of the uh, all of the shit, and, and kind of see the chrome shining through. Uh, you can see where technologically where threat intelligence feeds are trying to do something amazing. But it's being sold many times as just a glorified blacklist because the people that sign the checks are the ones that actually make those decisions and they're looking for that blacklist. No, I do want to. That's not the proper way. 
I do want to separate because when you I read articles about threat intelligence over the years, there are some that talk about the th- kind of threat intelligence we're talking about now, which is more of like an indicator of compromise or a blacklist of some kind or DNS blacklist or IP blacklist or whitelist, whatever. But uh, I actually say blacklist, not whitelist. But there's also the kind of school of thought that you should understand who your attacker is and get intelligence about the attacker. And that gets labeled as threat intelligence. And I, I think the community is kind of split. I think there are a lot of people who think that's completely worthless. And there are some that believe you should understand the motivations, the techniques behind the different groups, and that helps you secure your network. Where do you fall, John? I honestly don't have enough information at this point. Um, this is one of those things, honestly, we need to get Ben. Um, I think Ben mm-hmm. glove, glove slapped me, and uh, he challenged me to basically a conversation on this topic. Mm. And I, I I, honestly just don't know. Uh, it's it's kind of like the Citrix versus managed security service provider solution to the endpoint. I don't think that we're going to know for a while. Yeah. Um, I do think that there are good threat intelligence needs, and there are great companies out there that are trying to train their people to do better uh, whenever they sell a product, and those products and those companies are going to continue to thrive. But I do think that we're going to see a collapse in this field. I don't think that you're going to see threat intelligence feeds explode exponentially like they have. You're going to have the good ones, you're going to have the bad ones. The good ones are going to continue forth. So I like to think of it as, um, in theory, when I sit here on my theoretical analyst kind of like throne, <laughs> so to speak, which is totally made of like cardboard and duct tape. Um, I, I like to think that if I'm in a particular industry, whether it be healthcare or whether it be um, a point of sale retail environment, and there are specific groups of attackers that are utilizing certain techniques and certain malware, and they're coming after my industry specifically, that I should be able to gain some intelligence about them. And gaining intelligence about those groups that are attacking a specific industry in a specific way is is really good. But when I get off of my cardboard duct tape throne and I come down to the people who are actually doing the work as defenders, they're like, yeah, that doesn't work. They're like, I can see malware coming at my systems and I can reverse engineer it and understand their techniques and eradicate that from my environment. And I don't have to go to an external source or rely on an external source to tell me those things. And, and well, I think that's and, really the delineation between, you know, threat intelligence and practice. And I, and I think that a lot of people don't understand that the malware that's going to be used is going to be modified. And you go back to the Tridex malware. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, bl- it's blowing through these devices. Mm-hmm. It's blowing through these devices that have fairly robust IOCs and they have threat intelligence feeds driving them and they're making it through because all the malware has to do is change many times, just a, a very slight amount to be successful. Um, but if you tell me, like for example, if we have like some type of crypto locker style attack and it starts encrypting hard drives and I could be like, well, we need to see what drives and shares are available to my internal users and start locking that down. Well, you just learned something and you made an architectural change mm. that made you better. If you go to your management and say, look, guys, we're in banking and finance, and there is a group of attackers that are out there that are actively targeting a number of different organizations. This is how these organizations have gone down. And more importantly, these are the things we need to do financially to make sure that we don't get hit. Then it's an incredibly powerful tool. Absolutely. Because now it's a platform where you can share narratives yeah. and stories of attacks, and that's how you get funding. Yeah, and so John, you uh, once told me about some statistic about the overlap in the data from different threat intelligence feeds. Where, where did what is that statistic, and where did that come from? I can it's, never remember. Uh, it's, I, I think it's page seven or eight of the Verizon Data Breach Report from last year. I haven't checked the most recent one. I, I, um, I checked the most recent one. I didn't see any statistics like that. I got to read through it again, but. And, and we'll probably never get to see anything like that. But they did an overlap analysis, and there was five percent overlap. Mm. Um, so that means whenever they're writing up feeds, they're talking about different attacks, they only line up the same attacks and the same threats and the same IP addresses 5% of the time. Right. And that goes back to what I was talking about earlier. You need to make sure that you have the right threat intelligence feed for your specific in- industry. If you're working with something like FSISEC or you're looking at uh, Webroot or if you're looking at Symantec, all of those different groups have a completely different view of the cyber attack landscape. And that's important when choosing your threat intelligence mm-hmm. feed. A lot of threat intelligence feeds will say, well, we're good at everything. They're not. 
Um, if their main customers are in banking and in finance, and that's where they're getting all their data, they're probably going to be really good at banking and finance. Mm. If they are really, really into the education space, maybe that is the place to go, or the home user. And I, I think the best way whenever you're trying to talk to a threat intelligence feed is ask them, what market, market verticals do you find you have the less, uh, least amount of data in? And if they could say, well, DOD, DOD is one of those areas that we just don't have a lot of insight and visibility into. But in your area, something like 80% of our Intel feed ingests are coming from the exact same industry that you're working in, uh, be it banking, finance, selling watermelons, whatever it is you're doing, then that's probably a good fit for you. Right. But if they keep talking about, uh, if they say, well, Bank of America is one of our customers and you're in healthcare, that's a mismatch. And you're not going to have the same threats as Bank of America. So... I talk about with a lot of uh, customers and clients that threat intelligence is great <clears throat> if you integrate it into your other solutions. And we look at vulnerability management, uh, SIM and, and uh, you know, threat analytics, I guess we, we like to call it in the industry, right? Um, yeah. And endpoint protection. It, if it can be baked in, and I put a caveat on that, bake it into what you have, but don't pay anything extra or maybe pay a little extra to get that intelligence. I think that's a valid strategy. What's your thought on that, John? Well, that's uh, there's a bunch of companies that are kind of flooding into the market that are in the quote unquote value add space. Um, so if we look at Carbon Black, Carbon Black, mm -hmm. like you said, Carbon Black Bit 9 is one of our favorite product offerings out there. We love them. They do a really great job, but it becomes white noise. Um, it becomes very, very, very difficult to try to identify the actual attack with all of the process data, the injects, uh, inject data, the lateral movement data that's happening in an environment make it useful. And then there's companies out there like Red Canary and companies like Red Canary are going through and taking that data and they're trying to apply better intelligence and alerting around current attack vectors. And I think that that is a huge market, uh, but it's also a bit depressing, right? You basically have a company that's collecting all this information and then there's other companies that are actually going forth and trying to monitor that data and try to find the actual attack patterns in it. Um, so if you're looking at something like Silence, Silence has their artificial intelligence algorithm, which I'm 99% sure is complete crap, uh, just because they talk about artificial intelligence. But <laughs> as far as what the product itself does, it does something really cool. It does something very similar to what Carbon Black does, and it's, it, I think it's better at detecting attacks um, than Carbon Black, but it still comes back to a fundamental problem. Almost all of these products, whenever you run them in an enterprise level, they require a tremendous amount of resources to monitor, wade through, and trim down the false positives. It takes a lot of love, care, and feeding. So if you expect an apples-to-apples -apples solution between your AV solution and a Silence or a Carbon Black or Tanium-type uh, product, you're going to be sorely, sorely, sorely frustrated and disappointed in what you actually get out of it. So yes, I think that they're collecting that data. I think that if you can ingest those ISCs into those programs, and the programs get better at identifying attacks that don't perfectly match, or excuse me, attacks that don't perfectly match the IOCs, but are matching a high percentage of it, I think that you're gonna see these products get better. But many of these products are gonna be reserved for very large corporations that have the security budgets to actually do this properly. Um, you're well, yeah, see and, and deploy these, and what you're talking about is deploying the solution on the endpoint, which has a just, forget about the technology or how much it costs, there's a cost of just getting that to all of your endpoints. It's big cost. Oh, and, and there's a huge amount of pushback. I mean, you and I have talked about this in our IONS calls mm -hmm. with, our, with our various customers. I've had four calls in the past two weeks where people are freaking out about the number of agents they have yes. on their computer system. crowded space. But, yeah, this, this whole like agent bloat that's actually happening right now where you have 13 different agents for remote management, security, inventory, um, it, it's it's getting it's getting completely out of hand, and I think that that's a valid enterprise concern. And we're seeing agents that don't play well with each other. They blue screen out um, whenever they detect one or the other as being some malware, and it, it's a very valid enterprise level concern. Well, and I think what's interesting now is you if you want to take advantage of the best features of the agent based solutions out there, you're going to need a lot of agents on your systems. And I haven't mm -hmm. seen players emerge in the endpoint security or inventory or even vulnerability management game that have an agent that does a lot of things really well, right? Like the, well, I was involved with the agent for Tenable Network Security. It does, it's awesome at vulnerability management. Awesome, awesome, right? But 
you know, it, it, when you look at carbon black, you know, you're not going to get vulnerability management out of it. You're going to get some pretty good, you know, threat uh, 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 protection, but you're not going to get those other features. And then you look at Tanium, you're going to get awesome inventory control and really scalable, fast inventory control. But they have to integrate to get a lot of those other security features. And then you look at patching, and that's another area. So now, now I've got six agents on my system. Like, is there what? What else is there room for? Like, maybe a web browser, and that's it, right? Well, <laughs> and what I think is happening is we've hit a tipping point. At least I think we have. I don't know. This could all just be you know, trying to look into my crystal ball. But I think that most of these organizations that have all of these agents have realized that the blacklist approach of trying to detect malware, and yes, trying to use something like Tanium, trying to use something like Silence, well, Silence isn't pure blacklist, but that's a whole other conversation, but trying to develop and put in more and more and more and more agents to try to maintain what was going on in their environment is flawed and it's going to fall down. Mm. And I think that the only way out of this really nasty, scary, you know, thicket of woods is to start moving to an application whitelisting solution where you have complete control over what's installed on your endpoints as far as applications and nothing runs on your applications without you approving it. So then the question goes back to kind of tying everything together, what we talked about at the beginning of the show for enterprises and today, or right now, is enterprises have two choices. Either they continue to try to protect the endpoints and put more and more and more and more and more and more, and more agents on it, or they go whitelisting to try to more restrict it, or they go to a Citrix platform where their environment for accessing the application associated with the enterprise is maintained and it is easier to secure and manage. I think those are the three options that enterprises have moving forward. I think throwing more agents at the problem isn't going to solve it. Mm. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think it's the whitelisting approach is interesting <clears throat> because it's the complete opposite of threat intelligence, right? Yeah, and it is. Like we talked about Active Directory security uh, with Sean Metcalf, which was an awesome uh, discussion, Doing security is hard, and hardening your Active Directory environment is is challenging and a lot of work. Whitelisting is a lot of work, but these are the things that have the highest return in terms of security. And I think it's kind of an interesting paradigm that we've uh, created because people we've established that people kind of tend to go towards threat intelligence to get those quick, easy wins. When really the solution is that hardening and that whitelisting, which I think is part of the hardening process uh, for your environment, and those are hard and you need people to do that. And the hardest part is when you get people to do that and they've configured it, if those people leave, the new people coming in don't have quite the same grasp, even if they're also really good, they'll start on doing that security. <laughs> And well, so it's and such a process that. that it's difficult to maintain that level. And I think that's what turns a lot of organizations it, off. It, horrible, horrible, horrible analogy. It's almost like whenever, uh, a, if you have like a pride of lions, right? And the main lion goes away, is killed, something happens. The first thing the next in line lion, male lion does, is kill the young uh, from the previous right, lion. Right. And you see that all the time where they, you have a new security guy, new CIO, new CTO, new AV person. And they immediately try to rip out the predecessor's tools and put in new tools in their place. And we see that happen quite a bit. And it happens with pen testing firms. Trust me, I know this. It's like, well, that other guy really liked BHIS. I'm going with somebody else just because they got to do something different. Right. But I think that that, continue, that contributes to the overall bloat in an organization. And organizations have to figure out how to handle that properly. Well, thanks, everyone, for tuning into Enterprise Security Weekly. This has been episode two. We look forward to doing more episodes. Make sure you check out our other shows, Hack Naked TV, Paul Security Weekly. All can be found at securityweekly.com. Thanks for watching.